What's fun about Galaxy Quest? It's sort of hard to, something you made to say, oh, that's fun. I know that seems odd, but. I'll say it. What's not fun about Galaxy Quest? You got a rock monster. You got blue babies who are cannibals. You've got a bunch of actors who don't know what they're doing. You have an Omega-13 that you don't know what it is and you get to find out. It is meant to be a comedy, so we thought it would be fun. <laughs> amazing set of circumstances. There's been a few movies that I've had great pieces of, but top to bottom, Galaxy Quest, when we all the crew met and met with the director and saw what this, the situation was, every part of that thing was great. I've produced a number of movies and people will stop me and they'll say, oh, I really like this one, or I didn't know you did that one. You mentioned Galaxy Quest and it's just, more often than not, just people just break into a broad smile. I love that movie. It is such a loved movie. It came out of left field. People didn't know what to make of it, and they still don't. Guys, I was there. I was up there. Remember yesterday yeah. at the convention? Yeah. Those people dressed like aliens? They were aliens. They were termites or, or Dalmatians. I can't really remember because I was kind of hungover. The, uh, uh, I, th I think what's... Well said. Yeah, thank you. I had moved here to LA and I wanted to be a screenwriter and I uh, was writing a stage play at the time and I, it was about uh, a guy who had stopped eating and there were references in it to Africa. And uh, so I thought, oh, I better do some research on Africa, but I couldn't afford to go to Africa. So I, uh, I went to an IMAX movie about Africa. And while I was sitting in the theater, there was a trailer for uh, the next feature and I went, I know whose voice that is, but I couldn't place it. So I kept, it was driving me crazy. I kept listening and kept listening. And finally I went, ah, that's Leonard Nimoy's voice. And so, you know, this light bulb goes off in my head and I just started thinking about you know, how the guys decided, who should we get? Let's get, oh, Bill Shatner. No, we can't afford him. Let's get uh, Patrick Stewart. Oh no, he's in, he's in England. Uh, well, 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 Leonard Nimoy, he's, he, is he available? And I just thought about those guys and how trapped they are in those roles. <laughs> Sci-fi comedy. It's just a funny scenario. You know, it's just a really good idea. It's an incredibly, uh, you know, familiar, recognizable landscape. Are we not allowed to mention Star Trek? Uh, good, because I'm going to a lot. I mean, everybody knows about Captain Kirk. And when I first wrote the script and it was first covered, they said that this is a, a story that everyone will know about. What it does is it creates this in-joke with everybody on the planet. I had two really terrific people working with me, Elizabeth Cantillon and T Tiffany Daniel, who had read the first script. Well, in my draft, it's very different because in my draft, the villain is really the Alan Rickman character. He's written all these sci-fi novels and made a lot of money, and he has decided he's gonna discover the real thing out there. So he goes out and he starts doing all, all these uh, these crazy experiments, and he opens this rift in time and space, and goes to this planet and he kind of establishes himself as, as Ming the Merciless, you know, that, uh, this emperor of this world of, you know, very innocent people. And then, and they come back to Earth to get their Captain Starshine, you know, to, to come and say, because they know he's the guy that's gonna terrify them. So, so that's quite different. The producers came to me with this concept. They had this script called Captain Starshine. And I said, well, let me read it. And they said, no, we don't want you to read it. We don't want you to be influenced by it. Just go off. And uh, we love the concept go off and, and um, see what you make of it. Bob said, okay, okay, don't say any more, and left, and apparently came back a couple of months later and handed him this first draft, uh, which is pretty impressive, Bob. It's the only thing impressive I've ever seen. Thank you for the... From you. And that's pretty much the draft we made. He came up with the genius of the script. I remember reading the first draft and calling Walter Parks, who was the head of production then at DreamWorks, and saying, here, there's a movie here. You have to understand that this was the first feature that I sold. Uh, and uh, I, my story is the kind of story that makes people move to Los Angeles from Iowa, you know, uh, because it just doesn't happen where you sell a spec script, you're an unknown writer, and it becomes this gigantic, you know, feature. I was blown away. I actually, uh in college, watched every Star Trek five times. And he, you know, he hit every last aspect. It's like he took all the science fiction I'd read for 10 years and, and collapsed it into this one 
ridiculous, tragic story. My God, it's real. I didn't really know that I was a huge science fiction fan until I started writing. I, I didn't do a lot of research. I wanted to have my impressions of what those things were, and a lot of those cliches came out of there. Jason, we're gonna use the digital conveyor to get you out of there. The digital conveyor? Yeah. You mean I'm gonna be diced into cubes and set up there in a million pieces? Right. I was this freak for details. You can't just land on planets. And I, I was telling Dean this, and Dean is a great director, and he, he looked, what do you mean? You just can't land the stupid ship on the planet. Somebody's got a tricorder or something. We gotta test the oxygen level. We don't have that, Tim. Well, somebody's gotta test the air. And so we did that whole scene with, with Rockwell. He took that line, he goes, you can't just open the door, somebody's gotta test the air. Is there air? You don't know. Seems okay. I love science fiction. You get to invent all this stuff theoretically working in outer space. I, I could really appreciate it since I spent days and nights and months and years on sets like that. Commander, some of the crew has requested to be present at this historic event. Sure, bring him in. <laughs> it's not exactly a parody. What's brilliant, in my opinion, about Galaxy Quest, and I thought, well, when I saw it, they've made a movie just for me is that it manages to spoof affectionately the very thing that it ultimately manages to deliver on at the same time. Galaxy Quest is a have your cake and eat it too movie, and those are the hardest, I think, to pull off. Yeah! Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I, I don't really consider myself a Trekkie, and I guess my own personal definition is, is if you own clothing that that you know that comes from the show then you're a trekkie but but i'm a true fan i love i love star trek growing up they i think they just told great stories well in the first place i must explain that to call them a trekkie <clears throat> is um that's an insult they would say you're a trekker that was probably my favorite part i've never been to a convention i think that convention scared me forever the fans were brilliant they were in the most insane costumes. I think a lot of them were real fans. These were people who had experience with these conventions, and I just thought the whole thing was fascinating. Well, I actually went uh, about six weeks before shooting to one in Pasadena. So then I go into the bathroom. No, wait, this is my story. You can't tell the story. Then I go into the bathroom. The, my, my funny experience, this, you're actually stealing my story. I did the same thing. Wait, well, I did it first. I'm gonna tell it. Were we together in the bathroom? I mean, Dean and I go into the bathroom. There you go. Are we really doing this? <laughs> okay. Dean and I go into the, does this story work if we're both in the bathroom? It's odder, but yeah, it works. I go into the bathroom, and there are three Klingons at the urinals. And I just say, that's it. I don't have to write this scene. And it goes right in the movie. It has a great inherent misdirect in it. It starts out leading the audience into thinking that we're, we're doing a full-out parody of Trekkie conventions and so forth, and kind of looniness of, of that kind of crowd. And yet it's really an homage. Get up for the crew! The NSCA protector! If anything, it was, it was sort of embracing that lifestyle and that, that their imagination and their, and their passion. Um, and it, and it was more of a love letter. It's for and about those people. Everybody is in on the joke. You know, one of the things that was particularly uh, pleasing to all of us was how much the, the real Trekkies enjoyed it. I own the DVD because I said, oh, you know, this is a keeper. Most of the Star Trek people who have seen Galaxy Quest, they feel in a way that the filmmakers got it right. Hi, Brandon. No time for pleasantries, Kyle. We have a level five emergency. It's the fanatics, it's the diehard fans who actually end up saving the day. When the Justin Long character is contacted and, and his mother's making him take out the trash, he has to tell them how the bowels of the ship work. All right, we're at level C, hallway five. Now what? Um, go to weapons storage. Your second left through the passage. Nobody on Earth who knows the corridors of this ship, like Hollister or something like that. All right, that. Brandon, we're across. Now what? You want to take a left and then just straight on through the chompers. The chompers? The chompers is sort of the nucleus of this 
like everything folds back on itself during the Chompers because it's this device that was written ostensibly by a not so great writer of the Galaxy Quest show. It was there for no reason. It was sort of a very convenient plot device. Now it's been recreated for no reason. And now it's been recreated for no reason. And it's been made into like this 3D video game. At the same time, the Thermians are making real chompers on their real protector. They don't know why they're there either. Nobody seems to know why the chompers have to be stuck in this hallway. Well, screw that! The one piece of profanity that was uh, removed from the movie, what she actually said at that moment, which got huge laughs, but then uh, was removed because of the rating. Well, I guess I can't even say it here because it'll be rated. Was, 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 was it F? It was an F word. One, pick one. And it's funny because the lips you can tell, and, and and fans actually ask that. They say, "Did she really say that?" Well, it's pretty obvious. Pretty obvious, yeah. Hollister, do you have the sequence yet? Okay, the sequence is two, two. Four, two, two, what is this two, thing? Four, I mean, there's no useful three, purpose for there to be a bunch two. of choppy, crushy things in the middle of a West, hallway. West. No, I mean, we shouldn't have to do this. It makes no logical sense. Why is it here? Because it's on the television well, show. Well, forget it. I'm not doing it. This episode was badly written. Why am I being tortured by writers in this environment now? The Thermians have made all this stuff real. They've taken all this fiction, they've made it real, and now fiction is extremely important. It's the most important thing to everybody. OK, go now. Go! Sigourney and Tim are running through the chompers. And at the end of it, she says, whoever wrote this episode should die. And I'm right off, right off to the side of the set. And she looked at me, and she smiled. This was Sigourney Weaver smiling at me for this thing that I'd written of a thing inside a thing inside a thing. And it was just the, the most surreal and amazing experience. Listen, I'll go in. I'll create a distraction. I got this. I'm OK. I might be able to hold them back long enough for the aliens to escape. It's suicide. I'm just a glorified extra, Fred. I'm a dead man anyway. If I'm going to die, I'd rather go out a hero than a coward. The transformation from goofballs to heroes is really, I think that's kind of a great story to tell, too. <laughs> He is a hero. I mean, he played a hero, that cheesy rendition of a hero. But when, when push came to shove, darn it, the guy actually had it in him. I like the fact that the guy came around. We want our, our TV heroes to be real heroes, you know? I mean, I would kind of be really, really happy if, if William Shatner could really kick some ass. I love that second chance, and I love that redemption about that. When I really responded to that, something that's very honorable about a guy that could have run and he didn't. All of them could have run and they didn't. Alan Rickman has a nobility about him, so I think when he, when, when he says, you know, by Grabtar's hammer in the beginning, it's a joke to him. He's sick of the line. And then later on, when Pat Brains dies, you know, he, he really rocks the line for real. By Grabtar's hammer, by the sons of Warvan, you shall be avenged. If it works, it works as a great story about those people. And people say this about comedy all the time, but Dean really believes it. Comedy is played straight. You never play it for the laugh, and you have to make each character as believable as he or she can be. And the characters don't know that it's funny. The characters are just yeah. trying to get out of these ridiculous situations. I think it was Tim kept accusing me of making a drama. <laughs> Dean? Hmm. Don't remember him. What do you look like? It's just taking it seriously, and you're not in a comedy. You're in something deadly serious. These people are fighting for their lives. They're frustrated actors. It's not about gags. It's just about recognizing a human situation. It could have been a much broader comedy. When Dean got a hold of it, he said, play it as though it's real. This is really happening. That was the, that was the real genius of it. There wasn't a lot of gags, and yet it has laughs all the way through it. It, it comes from the top down. He kept it such an organic experience. You know, the studio kind of wanted us up in space, get on with it. And he was so intent on each of us establishing who we were. He really encouraged us to be our people and not just move the story along. And he was the, you know, he was the kind of litmus test of taste and how far to push it. As an actor working for a director, Dean Perso is perfect because he gives you enough rope to hang yourself and then he'll just pick you up and say, Great, now just bring it down a little bit. Dean really was a great leader on that film, really was.
really open to collaboration. He really wanted you to go off the page and have a lot of fun. Dean has a really nice head of hair. I get many, many compliments about Galaxy Quest, which is terrific because uh, it was as close to the movie I saw in my head as I've, as I've gotten so far. This just happened to be a rare occurrence when everybody was on the same page and everybody wanted the same thing. It's so hard to pin this movie down. This is such a peculiar, wonderful script and such a great director and such a great cast. I think it's one of the most enjoyed movies that I've ever been in. When I go over to Belize and people talking about Galaxy Quest and it's like, wow, you know, abroad, love it. People love it. It cracks me up when I see myself speaking Spanish. We didn't know what we were making, but we thought it was pretty special. And I remember when I first saw the first screening, the premiere at the Chinese Grommets, I thought it was going to be as big as Ghostbusters, you know. It was a very hard movie to sell. It was a very hard movie to let you know that we were not the movie inside the movie. And anybody who was expecting a Tim Allen movie was either disappointed or extremely thrilled. <laughs> it's only when people saw the movie and they said, oh my gosh, Tim Allen's brilliant in the movie. But they weren't sure what to make of it. I'm not going to go see that. The reaction I always got was, I thought I was going to hate this movie. And I really liked it. I really didn't think I was going to like it, but it was really funny. We're trying to get into the Green Mile and we couldn't get in, so we went to see Galaxy Quest. So it was like the second choice for a lot of people who went with no expectations at all. I really yeah. expected to hate it, and, yeah. uh, and I liked it. What? I'm just jazzed about being on the show, man. People come up to me a lot about that film. This movie, I mean, I, I really think it's a, it's a kind of a, a, a bit of a classic. It's a little gem, Galaxy Quest. You know, it's a little gem. It had such great legs with audiences. You know, I'm, I'm thrilled to see that it has a life almost 10 years later. We had hoped that might happen, and uh, I'm sort of amazed that it still does. I hope it's held up. I don't really know the answer to any of these questions. I always call it um, an infinitely watchable movie. It doesn't matter how many times you see it. So it's tapping into something pretty fundamental in what people want at certain times when they're in the mood and want to watch something called a movie. Don't forget to buy a Galaxy Quest t-shirt on your way out. Thank you.